Hi, good evening. Welcome to the May 9th, 2016 Cape Elizabeth Town Council meeting. Could we have the roll call, please? Town Council Chair McCausland. Here. Councilor Garvin. Here. Councilor Grennan. Here. Councilor Jordan. Councilor Lennon. Here. Councilor Ray. Here. And Councilor Sullivan. Here. Thank you. Will you join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Town Council reports and correspondence. Do we have any council members who would like to speak tonight? Yeah, yes, I just have um, two quick things. The first is that um, I wanted to announce that the next meeting of the Alternative Energy Committee is this next Tuesday, May 7th at 7 p.m. The location is to be determined, but please check the town website for um, the agenda and the, and the location of that meeting. And also, the second thing is um, to announce that, um, just so there's a good notice for the community that in a continued effort to continue and expand um, opportunities for citizen input and engagement, uh, we ask that the community mark their calendars for our spring community outreach forum that is going to be held on Wednesday, June 8th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. at the Thomas Memorial Library um, in their community room. And we ask people to join us so that um, we can he we'll touch base on a few of the hot topics around town and as well um, continue, to, as I said, to seek input from community members on, on things they want to um, give feedback on. So that's it. Great. Thank you. Any other counselors? Yes, Jamie. Thank you. Um, on last Wednesday, May 4th, the Spurwink School Committee held its first meeting, and I was elected to chair that committee. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for May 17th, which is a Tuesday at 8.30 in the morning. Um, briefly, on the, on the meeting we held last week, it was an organizational meeting. Um, <clears throat> going forward, we'll determine a regular meeting schedule. We intend, uh, as with all meetings, to have them be open to the public and encourage public input, whether it's at the meetings themselves or through correspondence with the committee. One of the things we did discuss, though, is that we're not planning at this time to do any um, formal resurveying of uh, the town at large or other department heads. Um, to solicit more ideas for uses. We've gotten a pretty good um, sort of canvassing of input so far, and we plan to work with what we have. Um, and the last thing I'd say is that um, due to a number of scheduling conflicts, the committee is behind in kicking off its work. We were actually supposed to provide an update to the council today um, on, on our work to date. So. Uh, our work to date has been pretty minimal. <laughs> uh, but as such, we'll be um, requesting uh, a, a extension of the, it wasn't really a deadline that was put forth, but the guidance to complete our work, at which point, um, at this point, we're actually looking at the end of July for bringing a recommendation forward with likely discussion at a September council workshop. So that's Great. all I on that. <laughs> Thank you, and congratulations on your new role as the chair of that committee, and thanks for stepping up to do that. Anyone else who has anything to report? No? Great. We will move on to the Finance Committee report with the links to the monthly financial report, and Mike, maybe you'll give us that overview on the yes. dashboard. Yes? yes, that's fine. The uh, finances continue to do very well, uh, particularly excise taxes, revenue sharing, hold it, holding its own. Building permits are down for last year, but uh, ahead of budget targets, uh, and, and everything else is pretty much as expected. We were helped by the light winter, uh, I think everyone is aware, of. and uh, overall we look to be in very good shape for uh, the end of the fiscal year. Terrific. Thank you. Any questions? No? I have ne next month we will. There's a couple of accounts that are always show a little bit of stress and yes. we'll be looking for a little bit more money f for those next month but but the monies will come from other accounts being underspent so and we have uh, a few of those that look we pretty do. good we do i did have one quick question on the taxes receivable our rate is at 98.5 percent yeah. pretty typical pretty typical uh deborah uh, sent out last week some uh reminders of to folks that hadn't paid their taxes and uh, another week or so, she'll be sending out 30-day notices of tax liens to a few folks. And 
when folks get those 30-day notices of tax liens, they tend to try to pay up uh, before the 30 days expire. Okay. Anything else I should add, Deborah? No. no. Thank you. That's it, Mike, on financials? Okay. Next up, citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anyone who would like to speak tonight to an item not on the agenda? No? Yes? You'll give us your name, address, limit your remarks to about three minutes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tammy Walter. I'm the president of the Spur and Carotta Gun Club, and I live at 1095 Sawyer Road in Cape Elizabeth. Um, last time, at the last meeting that we were here, I requested a, a hardship exclusion for our insurance. And um, I'd like to clarify that request after looking over the materials that were provided from the town attorney. Um, so we are seeking an amendment to our license. Also, um, I wanted to let you know that our previously, when we had a million dollars worth of insurance, the premium was 4200 and our current premium is 7100 for $3 million worth of insurance. Thank you. Thank you. On our agenda tonight, I think we'll have a discussion a little later on, but thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak to anything not on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on. Next up, town manager's monthly report. Yes, thank you, Chair McCausland. Just a, a couple of quick things. Uh, the fire department had their annual appreciation night last Saturday night. Uh, uh, Molly and her husband Barney were there, and, and I went, and uh, we had a really good-sized crew of volunteers and spouses from the, the fire companies, the rescue company, the fire police unit, the, the water rescue team, the... Uh, uh, by forgetting any groups. That's all I can think of. No, but anyway, it was, it was, it was a nice event. It's, uh, the town provides a dinner once a year for them. We had it at the Proputic Club. Uh, Proputic Club did a great job. Uh, they presented a, n a number of uh, uh, presentation awards for the Firefighter of the Year, the John Sibley Award, which mm -hmm. is uh, for longtime service to the department. And uh, they also, in the anniversaries, the, the top one was uh, one volunteer, used to be a, a volunteer, uh, by the name of Peter Gleason, uh, has now 40 years of service. Peter's the fire chief now. So uh, he has 40 years of ser four zero years of service to the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department. There are others that uh, were 35 years, mm -hmm. uh, Dan Hannigan, uh, Stevie Young, and Joe Mokri was 25 years, and a few others. I shouldn't start naming names. But it was a nice event, and uh, it was good to be there. Secondly. I did want to mention uh, that some of you may have seen some rhododendrons removed from coming up into the center of town, and people got nervous about it and thought it might have something to do with that project that's proposed for the, the woods in back of there. And it's a totally unrelated issue. Uh, one of the town council goals this year was to, to beautify the town center, and that included looking at what, what that little spit of land in the corner is known as the top box triangle. That included upgrading the landscape plan there. We actually had a landscape architect come in and suggested there were too many rhododendrons, it was overgrown, that we ought to take some of them out, put some smaller plants in, and, uh, and also the front of the community center office building next to the IGA it was all overgrown, kind of spindly plants there, and some also some work on the front of the Cape Elizabeth uh, elementary school where that, just that brick wall is. So there are a lot of people getting excited about it. They, they think something's going on. Uh, that relates to the development and back, and it, it really is totally independent of that. It has nothing to do with that. So I just wanted everyone to stay calm, and uh, planning board's continuing to review that other proposal, and uh, we'll see what happens with that uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to review of the draft minutes of April 11th and April 26, 2016 meetings. Do I have a motion to approve either or both of those sets of minutes? So moved on both. Second. Thank you. Discussion on both of those? Any comments, questions, concerns? No? All in favor of approving those? That's unanimous. And we will move on. We have a long agenda tonight, so I'm glad those went by quickly. 
We will move on to item number 58, the receipt of petitions regarding parking on Surf Road. Mike, will you introduce this item? I'd be happy to. The town council uh, received a couple of petitions regarding parking on Surf Road. For those that aren't familiar with Surf Road, it's the road that's offshore road closest to, to Fort Williams Park. Uh, the petition was signed by a number of residents there, and they had two petitions. One suggested that parking be limited to residents only, and the other uh, was to ban parking on the side of Surf Road closest to Fort Williams Park. Uh, the chief of police, who's here this evening, uh, looked at the petitions. Uh, we also looked at how it might fit into our traffic regulations, and you see on your agenda here a list of all our various traffic regulations where parking is allowed and where not, and uh, it's proposed to amend Section Q uh, to uh, comply or to be responsive to the request to have no parking on, on one side of the street. Uh, we didn't draft it one to have resident parking only. Both the chief and I feel that there's administrative requirements, burdens to that. There's issues of when people have company, when uh, you know, I'll just all sorts of complications you get into that we'd prefer not to deal with. But anyway, the recommendation is that you set this for public hearing at your regular meeting on June 13th. Thank you. Do we have there a motion? Members of the public here to speak oh. on it. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on that issue? No? Seeing none, I'll look for a motion to send this to a public hearing on June 13th. Thank you, Patty. Yes, um, I move that we set a um, public hearing on the proposed amendment um, for surf road parking on Monday, June 13, 2016, at 7 p.m. Um, at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall. Thank you. Is there a second for that motion? Thank second. you, Sarah. Any discussion about that? No? All in favor? Any opposed? No? That passes unanimously. Thank you, Michael. We will move on to the next item, which is number 59, the In by the Sea Annual Licenses. And Deborah, will you brief us on this? Yes, thank you. Uh, this evening, the Town Council has received the annual liquor licenses from In by the Sea for malt, vinous, and spirituous licenses, and a special amusement permit, again, for In by the Sea at 40 Barra Beach Road. Uh, as we do with all our liquor requests. We run this by our fire chief, police chief, and code enforcement officer. Uh, there have been no uh, objections or concerns raised. Uh, Mike Briggs, the general manager of the Inn by the Sea, is here this evening. If anyone should have any questions, uh, the recommendation is to approve. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve? Yes, Caitlin. I just have to disclose that my family's business does business with the Inn by the Sea. Thank you. Any concerns? Yes. Oh, no, I was going to move that we approve the license. Thank you. Is there a second for that? Thank you, Jessica. Any discussion? Any questions? No? All in favor? That passes unanimously. Thank you for coming and welcome to your new job here. Just if you yes. Mike. Michael is, uh, this is Michael Briggs, for those that are here. He's the new general manager of the Inn by the Sea. He's been at it for since February, a couple? Uh, April. Since April, yeah. just about a month into it, and uh, came here from Cape Cod where he managed another property and just want to welcome him to the community and uh, the town has a long tradition of working with the Inn by the Sea and in fact the, the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Chamber of Commerce uh, exactly. had an event there a week or so ago. Yes. Chair, Chair and I attended. Yes. Very nicely done. So. Welcome. As always. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I'm looking forward to working with my family here eventually. Great. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we will move on to the public hearing on the fiscal year 2017 budget. I will open the public hearing at this point. Is there anyone who would like to speak? Seeing no one, I will close the hearing and we will move on to item number 60 uh, 2016. Would the finance chair like to introduce this item, Kathy? Um, yes. Uh, what I'm going to make a motion on is to um, that the general fund budget contained items 60 through 65 be tabled to a special meeting on May 19th, 2016 for the purpose of keeping within that 30-day um, 
voting piece, um, then it goes to the voters. So I make such a motion. Thank you. Do we have a second for that? I'll second that. Thank you. Discussion? No? Any questions? All in favor? Any opposed? No? That passes unanimously. That's great. We will then move forward to item number 66. And again, could I ask the finance chair if she would like to introduce this item? I would, but some reason it's not in my packet. Could somebody help me with which one it is? Thank you. Um, okay, so we've got the Cape Elizabeth Rescue Fund budget. Um, so I move that we... Uh, okay, we, we've held a public hearing on this as well, Mike? This public hearing was... Is this separate? On the... Fiscal year 2017 budget, which would include all of those items all the way through number 74, yes, 74, no, okay. 75, okay. land acquisition, um, no, 74, items. sorry. I think so. So unless anybody has um, an objection, I thought that we would take these separately because there may be some questions on some of these items the counselors may have. We could do them in block, but I am suggesting that we do them separately. It won't take that much longer. I, I, Is that right? Yes, I think that's great. Okay. I'd ask for uh, it, you to introduce, particularly starting with number 66, and I agree. I think unless anyone is opposed, I think it's probably better to go through item by item. Okay. Thank you. So um, I would like to move that we approve um, the Cape Elizabeth Rescue Fund budget with expenditures of $440,936 and approved revenues of $390,000. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Sarah. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? <coughs> no, nope, that passes unanimously. Kathy, I'm just going to look to you to walk through each okay. one of these. Then moving on to item 67, the Cape Elizabeth Sewer Fund budget. I move that we approve um, that budget for fiscal year 2017 with expenditures of $1,951,587 and revenues of $2,300,000. Thank you. Is there a second on that motion? Thank you. Jessica, any discussion? No? All in favor? Any opposed? No, nope. that passes unanimously. Item number 68. The Cape Elizabeth Spurwink Church Fund Budget. I move that we approve um, the Church Fund Budget for fiscal year 2017 with approved expenditures of $9,209 and approved revenues of $4,700. Thank you. Is there a second for that? Thank you, Jamie. Any discussion? No? All in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Number 69. Number 69 is the Cape Elizabeth Riverside Cemetery Fund Budget. So I move that we approve the cemetery fund budget for fiscal year 2017 with approved expenditures of $55,784 and approved revenues of $44,500. Thank you. Do we have a second for that? I'll second it. Thank you, Patty. Any discussion? Questions? No? All in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous. Item number 70, the Portland Headlight Fund budget. Thank you. I, um, I make a motion to approve the Portland Headlight Fund budget for fiscal year 2017 with approved expenditures of $555,800 and approved revenues of $543,230. Thank you. Is there a second on that? Thank you, Sarah. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous. Number 71, Fort Williams Park Fund. I move that we approve the Fort Williams Park Fund budget for fiscal year 2017 with approved expenditures of $484,100 and approved revenues of $195,650. Thank you. Is there a second on that? Thank you, Jamie. Discussion? Yes, Jessica. Uh, yes, um, I would like 
to ask the town manager to review the process of, the, of this fund. Um, I do believe we're going to look at it later this year. Um, there, we have just received a priority list of items. And at what point will the council be able to review that list? Um, could you elaborate? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. The, uh, one of the town council goals this year is to review and approve a conceptual plan for the bleacher area of Floyd's Park. And the, the, the major uh, recommended appropriation actually is to uh, improve the bleacher area of Floyd's Park. So, you know, in, it, it indicates that that would come back to the council in June, but that first would be reviewed by the Fort Williams committee. So, you know, they, they, they have a, a draft of a, of a uh, concept, and I think, you know, they, they just need to finalize it and forward on to the council. I, you know, I think one of the, the other issues is the council also needs to figure out, you know, the, where do you want the, the major public input uh, to occur at the committee yes. level or at the council level or at both? And, you know, at your workshop on, on uh, June 9th, May 19th, that follows uh, your council meeting at which you're reviewing the general fund budget. One of the things you're going to be doing at is looking at goals. So you might want a little discussion it, on the, the, the process that you wish to utilize to uh, consider this proposal. Did that answer your question? Yes. Do you have any other questions? Yeah. I just so if so if we approve this, we still are taking more looks at the actual fund and how funds are distributed, you know, ultimately. Yeah, you know, I, I, let me say this. When you approve a budget, and if you don't specifically indicate that you want to look at something, it generally, staff moves it forward. In this case, there's a particular goal that says you want to review and approve the cons, you want to approve the plan. So in this case, yes, you'll see it. But when it comes to, you know, the, the minor repairs of, you know, the, the, the lesser amounts, the, the improving of fencing and, there are a couple of other minor things in there. You know, we wouldn't hold, the, unless you directed us to, we wouldn't hold those small ones up uh, because you didn't indicate that you wanted to review the concept plan. So okay. I'm trying to remember what else there is. There's the fence and there's a couple of, a couple of minor things. Yeah, but there are some large items in there. The large item is yes. the uh, amphitheater. proposed amphitheater. Yeah, okay, thank you. Other questions on that item? No? You all set, Jessica? Mm -hmm. I, I, Mike, I still have a couple of questions on that. So I have one very specific one about the public input, and you just mentioned that. Uh, personally, I'd like to see that happen at the commission level as well as at the council level. I'm assuming we would have a public hearing on that at some point when the project would come back to the council. But before it comes back to the council, I'd like to see that it, it's been vetted by the public at some level or in some way through the process at the Fort Williams Advisory mm -hmm. Commission level. So if we approve this tonight for the full amount, um, I know we have it in our goals that we're going to review it at our meeting in either later in May or in June. Would we then have one more opportunity to approve the project and would the public have an opportunity to weigh in um, on not only the project itself, but the impact on the community. What's the impact on the operating budget longer term in the community? What's the impact on the neighborhood for any additional operations happening at the port? Yeah, yeah that, that's my assumption, is that, is that you, you will want the public to have ample opportunity. And, you know, I, you know you've indicated, you know, tonight that you want it done at the committee level as well as here, and, you know, if that's the desire of the council, that can happen. I just thought that, you know, but tonight, you know, you could continue that discussion right now. I just thought that you might want to, looking at the agenda tonight, but maybe it won't take as long as we thought, that you might want to defer that discussion to them. But if you want to have it tonight, that's fine. Um, I'm open if other council members want to have that discussion. My intent wasn't so much to open up the discussion with the council as it was to ask you specifically to guide us in recommendations for how that um, approval process moves forward for the community and for the council. And if we approve the fund tonight, um, I want to make sure we haven't just signed off and said, we're done. We, you can spend the money, just come back and tell us what you're spending it on. And I think that's a very different situation than 
what, what I'm trying to communicate, yeah. and I think Jessica is as well. The, the goal of the council is to review and approve a conceptual plan for the bleach year of Fort Wayne's Park. Mm. You have not approved a conceptual plan. I think the intent when this goal was developed, uh, and it, you know, it indicates that it's to take place in June, there's always a little flexibility with the dates, but I think the intent was that it would come to the council from the, you know, first be reviewed by the Fort Wayne's Advisory Committee, that what the notes say, mm -hmm. back in January. Mm -hmm. And then it would it would come to the council in June or July, whenever, and that you would you would have a public hearings and public input, whatever process you wish to utilize. Yes. So then, it sounds to me that with the process that we've already laid out with our goal setting, if we were to approve this, we are still under no obligation to expend those funds. Yeah, I, I think I'm being a little bit repetitive, but you know, the staff will go ahead and spend the funds that are in this budget other than for the amphitheater, since you specifically segregated that as something that you want to approve the conceptual plan for. That is the question I wanted answered, and thank you. That is the answer I was looking for. Thank you. And I just have one other question for you, Mike, and that is on this write-up that we have. If approved, we would envision constructing, this is on the amphitheater, the project starting in spring, summer of 2017. Am I correct? That is yep. spring, summer of next year right. and the start of fiscal year 2018, correct? It might overlap a little bit in seven, both fiscal years, but the, the plan would be, the, the plan is not to start this, this uh, you know, we'd, we'd want to get it out to bid. You know, in projects like that, you want to get out to bid around February mm -hmm. because you get much better prices in February than you do in, in July or August. Sure. You do it when they're trying to line up the work for the year. So, so the plan would be, you know, if the project does get a go ahead, they would try to get it out to bid next February. Thank you. Any other questions? No? We're ready to vote on that item. All in favor? Any opposed? No? Unanimous. Thank you. Thanks for the extra input on that. That was helpful. All right, Kathy, we're back to you on number 72, the Cape Elizabeth Infrastructure Improvement Fund budget. Okay, thank you. Um, I move that we approve the Cape Elizabeth Infrastructure Improvement Fund budget for fiscal year 2017 with approved expenditures of zero and approved revenues of $30,000. <clears> Is there a second on that motion? Second. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Comments, questions? No. no? All in favor? Any opposed? We will move on to item number 73, the Thomas Jordan Fund budget. Kathy? Thank you. Um, I move that we approve the Thomas Jordan Fund budget for fiscal year 2017 with approved expenditures of $52,035 and approved revenues of $40,000. Is there a second? Thank you, Patty. Discussion on that? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to point out that if you look back at the original budget document, the approved, ex the recommended approved expenditure was less than that. The, the, the reason for the variance is, is that the Thomas Jordan Grants Committee met recently and they decided to vote to approve, I think, up to seven slots in preschool uh, to help out families that otherwise couldn't send their kids to preschool. So for that reason, uh, this funding provided in this number for that as well. There wasn't any formal discussion of the Finance Committee, but I just want to make sure that if, if anyone went back and checked all the numbers to explain uh, why the number has changed. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on that item? No? All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. We will move on to item number 74. And Kathy, I'm not sure which draft you're reading from. I will just say that um, this. Obviously the wrong one. <laughs> no, no. I, it, there's a typo in here or just something that got carried over from the item before. And okay. it says we're approving, again, the Thomas Jordan Fund. So just insert the land acquisition fund in that okay. language. Okay. Good. So um, I move that we approve the land acquisition fund budget for fiscal year 2017 with approved expenditures of zero and approved revenues of $32,014. Thank you. Can I have a second on that? Thank you, Jamie. Discussion? Nothing? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Any opposed? 
No, that's unanimous. And we will move on to, I think at the beginning of the next page, we just have the summary of all of those items. So we are at this point done with all of the budget items and we'll move into item number 75, the land acquisition fund appropriation. Do we have any members of the public who'd like to speak to this item tonight? No? Chair McCausland, before yes. we get into this item, I just wanted to um, make mention of my living uh, in very close proximity to this property and having personal relationships with some of the property abutters that uh, this will impact, so. Thank you. Anyone have any concerns with that? <clears throat> no? Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. So seeing that we have no one who would like to speak from the public, Mike, would you like to introduce this item? I'd be happy to, and, and Maureen is here as well. Uh, for quite a few number of years, uh, the town planner has been working on this issue. At times, the land trust worked on this issue. And, and what the issue is, is we own, if you look at the map over here, where Lovett Woods is about 18 <laughs> acres, but that extends, if you look at then the map on the right, into all of the Robinson woodland, which is all that yellowish goldenrod color, and then all of the green that's sort of uh, on the left side of that, heading heading north, all the way up to this this one, almost to this one lot at, at the very top. And uh, you know, it 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 doesn't close the deal for for totally connecting because if you look at the map on the left, there's a small piece that's on the Bryant property. Uh, that would uh, need at some point to be acquired in order to get a connection there. And there's also a small piece at the end of London Road that, that remains private property. But as in, in every case with, with the Greenbelt over the years, is that you know, it's been a, a continuous effort to try to fill in the links. This, this is a major, major piece, very significant piece, very, very significant piece, because it, you know, is all of that land I just, you know, pointed out on the map, ties it to the whole Oak Hurst neighborhood. Uh, we went back and forth quite a few times with the, with the property owner. Uh, yeah, you know, the, uh, it, it's, it's quite a bit of money. You know, we, we, we realize that. It is all proposed to come from the land acquisition fund. Uh, <coughs> Maureen and I, and as well as the Conservation Commission, believes it's good investment. And uh, Maureen met with the Conservation Commission uh, when they, she was there when she discussed this, and maybe she might like to relate as well the Conservation Commission uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. So uh, the Conservation Commission asked me to work on this. I've been working on it since before 2012, so it, it has been a long road. Um, their recommendation, they met last week, and their chair is out of town this week. That's why there's no one here, but they care. Their recommendation was to strongly recommend purchase of the Willens lot for the asking price of 75000 and note that it had, correlates with many of the goals of the 2013 Greenbelt plan. Thank you. Any questions? Anything else you'd like to say? I could go on at length. I didn't want to do that unless you wanted me to. <laughs> We'll let you stay there for just a minute and we'll see if there is a motion on this item. Yes, Kathy. I move that we authorize the town manager to purchase a 0.89 plus or minus acre lot adjacent to 8 Rockwall Lane for conservation purposes and to authorize the expenditure of 75000 from the land acquisition fund for the purchase and such additional small amounts needed for filing fees, etc., related to the purchase. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Sarah. Discussion. Any questions for Maureen? Yes, Caitlin. What would the development plan for trail be? Um, like, will we be advertising that there's a trail in there immediately after the purchase? So we, the policy of the town is not to create dead ends, and we never show so trails where we don't have legal public access rights. So right now, we have rights up to this point and we would own this piece in yellow, and there's no way to get there without crossing private property. However, we feel very confident after a meeting we had today that we're going to be able to acquire this link. So we'll be able to show something coming up to here. We will not show a link on private property without their permission. 
but there is room here to do some kind of loop trail and I'm speculating the Conservation Commission hasn't worked that through but this is really very nice land. I mean, it's, it's unusual usually the open space the town gets has lots of wetlands and lots of constraints and there is plenty of opportunity here to to wiggle this trail around to do other things it's being used daily right now by the neighborhood right does that answer your question yeah i just that's my concern is once we if we purchase it and you put a trail in there then you're just advertising and asking people to go across private property more than what they already are that's my only hesitation we wouldn't until we had something here we wouldn't do that. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Jessica? I don't have any questions for Maureen, although I would like to, to speak to the, the item. Please do. Um, I, I'm in favor of this purchase. Uh, I was the Conservation Commission liaison for three years, 2010, 11, 12. This parcel was discussed then. And this has been a top priority for the Conservation Commission since I've been on the council and, and since I've been aware of all that. I think it's important to point out that the, the funds in the Land Acquisition Fund have been there. Uh, they are saved for this express purpose. The Land Acquisition Fund came out of the future Open Space Preservation uh, Committee. And two sitting councilors, myself and Councilor Jordan, were on that committee. And as a result of that, the council voted to allocate funds from everyone's tax bill. And what I can't remember is how much it is. Is it one dollar? It's, it's a penny. A penny. One or two. A penny. A penny. Two, two pennies, actually, now. Two, two pennies. So out of every tax bill has gone into this land acquisition fund. And uh, in my opinion, this is precisely the type of situation for which this fund was created. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak to this item? Yes, Jamie. Thank you. Um, I mentioned my proximity to the property, and um, as such, I just wanted to uh, share not only my views, but some of the views that have been expressed to me by some of the folks that live in the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> this is something, uh, this lot is, and the access it provides to the Lovett Woods is something I think the vast majority of people in this section of Oakhurst value greatly. They think it's a tremendous resource uh, for the neighborhood. That all being said, as Maureen alluded to and was raised in Councillor Jordan's question, there does remain the question of um, completing the full access to what is today a casual access point through um, you know, somebody's private property at the corner of Glendon and High Bluff. Um, I'm really torn on this because I've heard from people in my neighborhood that, um, you know, use the trail daily. I use the trail that's there now, the casual trail that's there now on a regular basis. Um, but there's certainly folks that live in this corner of the neighborhood, um, you know, who've both formally expressed their concerns through correspondence with the council and the Conservation, conservation Commission. Um, as well as to me personally. So I just wanted to, to make that point known and have that voice heard. Um, at the end of the day, I stand in favor of the acquisition. I um, am not wild about the cost, though I know that the fund is there for that express use. I still think it's a great deal of money to pay for this particular lot that's um, uh, assessed at uh, quite a bit less than that. Um, I'm hopeful that through cooperative um, negotiation with the other existing landowners, be it the Bryants or the Van Dessels, or other interested parties like the Blakes and others in this corner of the neighborhood, that we'll be able to come to a collaborative and um, uh, stewardship-focused use of this property going forward. Um, so that's the opinion I wanted to express. Thank you. Anyone else? Maureen, I just have one quick question for you on the motion as it exists. It says we are authorizing the manager to purchase this lot for conservation purposes. Would that language, or maybe this is a question for you, does that give us the opportunity to put the Greenbelt Trail on there if, it, if we're approving it for conservation purposes? Yes, we've, we've actually got an outline of what we want to do for conservation.
conservation purposes and um, Tom is here and he'll be drafting the deed if you so vote and the thought is that it would say things that we typically see in conservation easements where principal and accessory structures are not allowed greenbelt trails greenbelt boardwalks would be allowed signage would be allowed motorized vehicles for maintenance purposes would be allowed so you know it would be the kind of provisions that basically will keep the lot looking the way it is right now great thank you um, I too will be voting in favor of this and as the uh, liaison to the Conservation Commission for the last two and this is my third year um, we too have been talking about it for a long time and it is a pleasure to have something like this come along and to be able to have the funds available in that land acquisition fund and um, I just made a couple of notes on some items from the Greenbelt Trail that I thought were particularly interesting in this particular case that um, by the time that we get this uh, fully accessible we'll open up access to the Greenbelt system for close to 200 homes in the Oakhurst area that is astounding to me I think that is tremendous and give people access as you pointed out, Mike, all the way down through, really almost all the way down to Great Pond. Is that right? Yes. That's yes. wonderful. And um, uh, we have a number of other goals in the 2013 Greenbelt Plan, including preserving open space in its natural state, preserving habitat, and Jamie spoke to this a minute ago as well, formalizing trails, including those in neighborhoods with casual trails that will provide um, now legal access. All good stuff. I'm happy to be voting for it, and I'm really pleased that we were able to bring the number down on the purchase price to something that was a little more manageable. So thank you for your work on that, Maureen. Anyone else have anything they'd like to add? Yeah. Yes, please. Just the lot that's on the south that's owned by the Bryans. I just want to underline, Maureen, yeah, but particularly where the trail cuts across, Maureen, as she indicated, I just want to underline, it did meet with the Bryants today and had a very positive meeting. They do want to work uh, with the town, which is uh, very pleased. Very helpful. That's great. And Maureen, I will just ask, since uh, the manager just brought that up, the Conservation Commission had also looked at the possibility longer term of doing something with the boardwalk and I only mention that because um, I'd like to give you the opportunity to talk about the cost of doing the boardwalk alternative relative to the cost of purchasing this piece of property. Sure. So, you know, this, this whole neighborhood of Oakers is just a phenomenally charming neighborhood, very compact, very walkable. And it's not unusual to have these little tiny trails that wind in through people's property to get into places. But we've tried for a long time to have a conversation about this property and have been unsuccessful. So we did look at some other options. If you look north of Oakhurst Road, we have this uh, sewer easement. We have some property here. We have some property here. So the other thought was, well, let's try to get from this point down to Lovett Woods. And we looked at this, and I don't think it's showing up very well, but this is all wetland here. So one, we would still have to acquire some rights because we don't own anything here. And we were looking at roughly 370 feet of boardwalk. We estimated that cost. If we put in a boardwalk similar to the boardwalk at Great Palm of $70,000. Great. Thank you. And I'll just say, I love boardwalks, but I think this is a much better option than putting in such an extensive and expensive boardwalk system. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Any opposed? No? That's unanimous. Thank you, and thank you, Maureen. We will move on to item number 76, which is the consent agreement approval. And do we have any members of the public who would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, I will ask the manager if he would introduce that. Yes, uh, thank you. This item was on your agenda uh, last month for an initial consideration, and you indicated that time that you'd entertain a proposed consent agreement. Uh, for those that, that weren't at the meeting or, or they're just catching up on the issue, uh, this involves a home at Ten Star Road that uh, put an addition onto the garage, uh, added, added a garage, 
it, that it was within the setback to the front property line by, by a little over five feet. Uh, this was discovered as they were trying to sell the house to have a survey. Uh, they had, had a survey done and you know the, the owner himself was the contractor. Uh, and you know it, it's just very it's very sad, but at the same time, you know, they, they went to the, the zoning board, the zoning board wouldn't grant a variance because uh, there's really no standard when someone does that to do that. So anyway, uh, we uh, through Ben McDougall's efforts working uh, with Monaghan Leahy, uh, law firm uh, worked uh, with the attorney representing uh, the owner of 10 Star Road and we do have is, is before you it's a consent agreement uh, that resolves the issue that allows the construction to stay in place as it is that provides for a five thousand uh, dollar fine uh, that would go into miscellaneous revenues uh, if you want to where it goes and then that they would also reimburse the town for up to two thousand dollars for its costs for legal and other costs and we expect it to be less than that but uh, it the, the agreement provides for up to two thousand thank you <clears throat> do i have a motion to approve the proposed consent agreement so moved thank you patty do i have a second thank you jessica any questions jamie I also have a question for the manager about how the fine amount is ar gets arrived at. I know that there were there have been previous examples of things like this, and I don't recall yeah. whether or not the fine was the exact amount or different, but I feel like it was different. So, anyway, if you, you know, could just speak to that. You know, I discussed with Ben McDougal, discussed a little bit with the council chair, discussed it with with our attorney, uh, and you know, there's. What we didn't, don't want is a set formula that for every foot it's so much money. And I look at it, it's, it's a little like the Richter scale of earthquakes. You know, a, a one foot violation compared to a five foot violation, that it's not, it's not a scale of one, two, three, four, five, that is, as the violation gets bigger, it becomes a larger issue, a larger problem, and that there needs to be a multiple in dealing with it. But you know, I, there's no community that we know of that has a set formula for how to deal with these things. Uh, and you know, we looked at Ben and I initially discussing it, and what would be the cost of taking the garage down, uh, you know, or, or you know, you know, moving it back, and you know, the, the resulting you know problems with that. And you know, and, and there needs to be some. You know, other if you don't have a penalty that's fairly tough then you get into a situation that, you know, people aren't going to pay attention to these setbacks. And, and that causes a, a lot of problems. Uh, so there isn't an exact formula. It, it, it seemed to be the right amount based on these circumstances because it was, it was a fairly sizable uh, uh, issue. And there, was, and there was some other issues which I, which I won't go into, you know, that, that I don't think add to the public dialogue, debate. Uh, in involving some other issues involving the property that, that this amount seemed appropriate. But th there's no magic to it. Thank you. Other questions? No? <clears throat> All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. We will move on to item number 77, the Spurwing Rod and Gun Club Insurance Hardship request. I know that we have our town attorney here. Thank you, Tom Leahy, for coming tonight. Uh, Michael, would you like to introduce this item? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to briefly. Uh, the town council received a while ago, as, as uh, uh, Tammy mentioned uh, earlier in the meeting, uh, a, a request for a, uh, an amendment to the ordinance or a hardship. It was clarified through the town attorney working with the, the, the gun club that they really weren't asking for a, an amendment to the ordinance. What they're asking for was a hardship, which, which is a provision that's already allowed uh, in, in the ordinance uh, for the council to be able to, to give a hardship exemption uh, under certain circumstances, which if you need to go into those details, Tom's here for that. Uh, but anyway, that, that, that's, that's the background. The, the Rod and Gun Club wants to uh, have the insurance requirement reduced from three million to a million. Uh, the council's received a number of pro and con emails on that, and I'm sure looking at the audience, there probably have some folks that would like to perhaps discuss this. <laughs> and the town attorney is also here, is kind of, he does insurance defense, so 
in addition to representing municipal municipalities, so he's not unfamiliar with some of these issues. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Lee, he's also here to talk about the other issue that relates to the, uh, the gun club. And the, the governor recently signed a bill, LD 1500, uh, that involves the, commu the communities like capitalism municipalities right to regulate gun clubs. And he's looked at that law and uh, he, he's available this evening to share his opinion on how that might affect people as well. Great, thank you. So why don't we start with any members of the public who would like to speak to this item? Is there anyone who would like to come up? If you'd like to speak, would you come right up to the podium, give us your name, your address, and try to limit your remarks to about three minutes. Thank you. Albert Hutchinson, uh, wife and I own a home at 13 Apple Tree Lane, which is off Cross Hill, so it's somewhat in the neighborhood. And I would pose it in the form of a question. Uh, you people run the town, have a responsibility to the citizens. Why would you want to reduce insurance? Suppose somebody gets injured and the million dollars is not enough, then what happens? So I generally would oppose reducing insurance. I understand that a consultant was hired, consultant made recommendations, and I don't have the details, but apparently there's a, a request, I'll put it this way, liberalized their uh, permits so that they could open up a 50 yard and a larger ranges, um, which uh, I would object to. And uh, so I have to ask, if a consultant who is an expert did a study and made recommendations, which is my understanding, uh, then why would you, as the council that runs the town, not want to follow those, that, those recommendations? Would there be a reason you would not want to? And would you, in effect, want to liberalize um, the regulations so they can go ahead and open up the larger shooting ranges before the safety measures were put in. So that is the gist of my thoughts on this. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Please come right up to the podium. Hello, I'm Eric Stephanus, uh, number two, Tiger Lily Lane. I'd like to speak against the, uh, mo the motion to reduce the uh, insurance uh, through a hardship request. First, let's review the facts. The $3 million figure is an estimate of the level of insurance necessary to shield the town from a liability lawsuit. Essentially, by lowering the coverage, the town would be subsidizing the club because that would leave the town exposed to suits in excess of $1 million a level of coverage that was deemed inadequate at the time the ordinance was drafted and passed with the guidance of the town attorney. The risk the town would, be, would take by reducing the $3 million amount is actually a risk to be assumed by the taxpayers of the town because taxpayer money would have to be used to settle any lawsuits in excess of $1 million. So those are the facts. Now I object to having taxpayer money used to backstop a politically affiliated group, which is, of course, what the club became five years ago when it made NRA membership a mandatory requirement for club membership. And before someone comes up here and calls me a gun hater, let me make it clear that I have nothing against gun ownership and I support the Second Amendment. However, I vehemently disagree with the powerful NRA-funded lobby against rational regulation of guns in schools, places of worship, establishments that serve alcohol, as well as other NRA positions on issues such as private sales of firearms. With five million members, the NRA represents less than 2% of the American people, and only about 5% of the estimated total of American gun owners. By switching to compulsory NRA membership, the club has automatically excluded at least 90% of Cape Elizabeth residents. By the way, I understand that at the time of the switch, even a number of club members resigned because they disagreed with NRA policy positions. This radically changed the relationship of the club to the community. 
The important point here is that the town should not be backstopping the local affiliate of an organization with a public policy agenda which many people in town, perhaps a large majority, may strongly oppose. Before using taxpayer money this way, I would suggest a town referendum to see if the citizens agree. The town has already given the club a free pass when it magnanimously absorbed the cost of the professional safety evaluation, which was actually the responsibility of the club to obtain as part of their shooting range license application. Moreover, the assertion of hardship seems to have little merit. The club keeps its dues much lower than other clubs, gun clubs in the area. It's not the town's responsibility if the club decides not to ask their members to pay reasonable market rate dues to meet expenses. I think the generally accepted idea of hardship is a family faced with difficulty maintaining their primary residence because of sickness or other personal misfortune and not a restricted membership sporting club with a cash flow problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Good evening, Mark Mayon, former president of the uh, Spurman Ground and Gun Club. Uh, I would first like to thank very much the friends of the NRA who have supported our club with very large grants of money since we have uh, become a NRA uh, required uh, membership. And as far as our dues go, many of our members are on fixed incomes and we have raised our dues almost almost 100 percent in less than five years. That is very painful for many members to have to absorb. We ask some members to pay for members who can't absorb that cost, and so far we have had members step up to the plate to pay for people who can't. Um, our safety evaluation that we provided uh, for the town um, was not acceptable to the town. So the town found one that was acceptable to them. And so the notion that uh, we did not supply something is a false notion. Um, one of the things that our club has really worked very hard at recently is to work with uh, the reasonable neighbors in our, in our immediate vicinity to get input from them to what they would like to see the club look like. And we have been working towards that recently uh, you know, through volunteer, uh, through our members volunteering to do stuff around our club. So we're trying very hard to be, um, we're trying very hard to be a productive member of this community. And we really uh, appreciate the work of the people in the town who have helped support us and uh, we just want to be able to give back to the town and the capacity that we can for what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? No? Um, at this point, unless any council member feels differently, I would like to ask our attorney to come up and talk to us a little bit about what we have heard tonight and um, if anyone has any specific questions. Uh, I think we have two separate letters from you on the insurance request as well as some guidance on the um, uh, changes potentially coming our way based on the new legislation, LD 1500. So, um, you tell me, would you like to start with the insurance or like to give us the context first in LD 1500? Well, the uh, LD 1500, uh, Madam Chair and members of the Council, um, is a law that's been approved. It's not yet effective. It's not effective until July 29th of this year. So this application tonight for an uh, amendment to the license of the Spurring uh, Rod and Gun Club uh, needs to be reviewed by you under the ordinance provisions for hardships. Um, the, um, I believe the record would show that um, Tammy Walter first presented some evidence about the increase in insurance costs if 
they would increase the insurance from one million per occurrence to three million per occurrence. And then saw the testimony <clears throat> from Mr. Mayon um, on the issue of dues. So I was not, I was the town attorney through the time of adoption of this ordinance. For various reasons from time to time, the town uses other attorneys. So I really am not privy or have any uh, insight on the establishment of a $3 million per occurrence liability insurance requirement. Um, I should point out that that provision goes further and states that the applicant shall have insurance, but then it goes on to say the applicant shall hold the harm, harmless a town as well. So there's a legal obligation to hold the town um, harmless from any liability, and then insurance is the uh, mechanism we would look to mostly to uh, address that. Um, as far as uh, what standard, I don't represent gun clubs. I don't know what standard. No one, uh, what we have is the applicant stating to the town that NRA does provide through a partner liability insurance to, and they have over 9,000 ranges, and that um, the limit of insurance, liability insurance provided is one million. Um, so as far as standards, I mean, that implies that that is a standard requirement. Um, I do mostly commercial uh, transaction work. Uh, in every commercial transaction, a bank's financing uh, the construction or just refinancing a commercial building, uh, insurance is required, both property insurance for fire and other property claims, as well as liability insurance. Um, um, owners want to make sure that if somebody slips and falls on the premises, they're not going to be sued, and banks want to make sure that if they happen to sue the bank, they're covered as well. In my practice, with many, many banks in the general <coughs> Portland area, the requirement is one million. Um, you know, there, there's no minimum or maximum, but that's the general requirement of all the banks that I do work for. There are cases where uh, banks for very large projects may consider it wise to have a greater amount. I've always thought it makes more sense to look at what you're protecting against. It's not the size of the loan or the size of the building, it's the risk. Um, but going back to the $3 million, I don't have uh, particular insight of how that amount was obtained. I don't, I don't, I haven't heard that that amount was ever maintained historically by uh, Spurring Parade and Gun Club. Um, so what I think the council can do tonight is um, they've heard testimony and they can go through um, the hardship criteria and there are eight standards and make a determination if the uh, applicant has met uh, those standards set forth in the uh, in the uh, uh, ordinance provision. Um, again, I'm, <clears throat> I can right now or later address the LD 1500. Um, it, it could be impacted if this came up at that time. Otherwise, I assume it would come up upon a license renewal or some later application for an amendment by, the, uh, by this applicant. Okay. Thank you. I'm willing to answer any questions. I'm not sure if I address what you wanted to hear. I think in order for us, I'm really trying very hard to get my Roberts rules down, and I think in order for us to start our conversation about this particular item, we need to have a motion on the table. So do I have someone who would like to make a motion on item number 77? Caitlin. I move that we reduce for reason of hardship, the liability insurance to $1 million. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so do we have council members first who would like to ask questions of Mr. Leahy? Sarah. I have a few questions. My first is, what is the annual cost of $1 million versus $3 million? Oh, I'm sorry, it's here. We had that answered, I think, earlier. I think we heard it was $4,200 for a million and $7,100 for $3 million. Is that correct? Thank you. My second question is, um, 
when you say that legally, legally they hold the town harmless, it, I, I, I take that to mean that if a lawsuit went over a million, if they were to have a million dollars and the lawsuit went over, the town itself could not be held liable for the remainder. Is that what that says? Kind of. What it says is, um, it, first of all, it establishes um, uh, a liability. It states that if you are a licensed gun club shooting range, um, then you need to hold the town harmless. A provincial could stop there. It could just say that if there's an accident and if we're sued as a town, you, an entity, shall hold the town harmless. Um, in tandem with that, to give it uh, support, the town went on to say, and by the way, you shall maintain insurance and per occurrence, it didn't say per aggregate, it says per occurrence, it shall be no less than three million. So, so it's, it goes hand in hand, clearly it goes hand in hand. So in practicality, let's just say hypothetically something happens and the gun club is sued for more than a million, if we were to grant this, let's say they're sued for five million and they can't pay that because the insurance company says, I'm sorry, we're only covering you for a million. Where does that other four million come from? Could a good lawyer compel the court, the town to pick up that difference for any reason? I'm just, I'm just trying to, tease out what our risk is in, sure. at, in the town? Sure. It's a good question. I, I really uh, didn't prepare well for that question, but I mean, I don't think um, if something happens in this town, uh, you may require that for a liquor license they have insurance, liquor liability insurance, for example. That may be imposed upon a, uh, 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 an operation. Th does that mean the town would be sued if, if, if a lawsuit was in excess of uh, an insurance limit? I don't think so. There has to be a connection with what the town has done. What liability does a town have for the action of a gun club? Uh, I think what you have is you have an attempt to regulate, to provide certain provisions. Um, this is one, and it could have been one million, it could have been five million, it could be two million. Uh, I, I, so I, I, I cannot right now say that there's a great risk because I can't see the basis of that lawsuit that the town um, failed to require a greater amount of insurance if one million is what NRA generally standard has throughout the country and if that's um, what I see in my commercial practice. So final question, sorry and then I'll shut up. Um, I, I'm, I'm, gr I'm, I'm trying to grasp the significance of this beyond a hypothetical, because let's say someone sues for a whole bunch of money, um, the club can only pay the amount it has, and then the rest they can't pay. And if we don't have to pay it, no one pays it. So what's the difference between having one million and three million? I mean, if someone gets sure. shot or killed, they're going to sue for way more than either of those. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm failing to grasp the practical significance of the difference between one and three million dollars of insurance yeah. coverage. That's a good question. Um, they're somewhat arbitrary. I mean, uh, I suppose we, uh, anybody can sue anybody for any amount. Start there. Um, it's not true that over a million, the gun club would have no exposure. The assets of the gun club would be at risk. So a judgment against the gun club, not the person who fired the shot, but the gun club, uh, should it succeed, would, could reach a million dollars of insurance and could, could reach its assets. Oh, like its land or something? Pardon me? Like the land or yes, something? Yes, exactly, the land and whatever facilities they have, whatever assets they have in the bank. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a matter of degree, there's no question in my mind. Um, it's, it's whether it's good governance to require, I mean, you, I can see the town would never be questioned on one hand if they require more insurance for any activity in town because it's just good to have more insurance. I can see that. But I think we have to balance what's reasonable, uh, what we heard about the dues, about the increase in insurance costs. I, I think it's a question of whether it's a hardship um, on this applicant to provide that uh, desired insurance. Um, so let, let's, 
Uh, I'm going to transition a bit to the state legislature uh, recently adopted LD 1500 because that relates to this a bit, uh, Councillor, um, in this respect. What the state has said, effective July 29th, um, is that so long as the club com conforms with generally accepted safety practices or constructs its facility for shot containment, not reasonably likely that a shot projectile would leave the uh, range, um, then you can't enforce your, cannot enforce your ordinance to the extent it would limit or eliminate the activities of the range. So then the question is, what does that mean? Does that mean you can't impose a requirement that they put up signage uh, to prevent access or um, locking of a gate to prevent access, what have you? No, I think that's probably okay. I think that's within reason. But when the regulation reaches a certain point, um, I think it's not a hardship. It's whether that regulation is limiting uh, the historic activities of the club. Let me give you a non-controversial one, perhaps. Let's say the club operates from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day, historically. Um, I don't think an ordinance could be uh, applied to that club after the effective date of LD 1500, which would say they can only be open on Saturdays and Sundays, um, noon to 5, and close the other five days of the week. I think what the legislature was saying is that that sort of regulation uh, that would limit its historical activities is not allowed. It's been preempted by the state. And the, and the uh, application of the ordinance uh, to uh, a party, a uh, gun club or range, um, cannot be enforced. Um, that's under the uh, preemption. And whereas under home rule you can adopt regulations um, that are not expressly or impliedly restricted by the state, uh, this is an area where I believe the state has preempted the town, whether it was noise historically or now other regulations beyond noise. So I think the easy question would be something like the hours of operation. I think that's pretty clear that any, no town could say you can only shoot for two hours a week instead of um, seven days a week. Um, I think when you get into the finances uh, or the financial impact, I think it's a little different. It's a little vague, more vague in my opinion. And I said if it's uh, denying uh, access by the public, by children, signage, I don't think a court would say the town is pre prohibited, preempted to regulate that far. But I think when the regulation is such that, you know, it crushes a range uh, financially, uh, it would. So does this, I'm not saying it does or it doesn't, I think those can be a factual determination by any town if it's reviewed under the legislation not yet effective. But tonight I think you're reviewing this under hardship. Um, I provided a draft motion just to have something in front of you to uh, list the eight uh, criteria. And obviously it's not for me, it's up to a council, a council member if that's uh, uh, appropriate. Thank you. <clears throat> Kathy. Do we have that? Because I was looking for the eight items. We do. Is it off of the, uh, is it part of the, um, I don't know, maybe I can that come in an email? Thing. I'm, pass that down. I'm sure I can find it if I can find it. Councilor Ray, I have an extra copy. So, like. Under supporting documents? It wasn't there. It's it was a draft that came today's. out today, and it came in an email, email. I think. Email today? Okay. Yeah. Draft, May 9th. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I just have a question. I, um, if it's okay, when they look at the three thousand dollar amount, do we have the three million dollars? Three million, excuse me, three million dollar amount that was set previously by the shooting range committee and put in the ordinance. It, I know that Tom, you said you weren't involved in setting that. Um, Correct. Is there any can anybody speak to Mike or what was the rationale originally of why that number was chosen or how we got there or Chasing Caitlin? Himself. It, it wasn't the shooting range committee, it was the ordinance committee that put the three million into the ordinance. So I had nothing to do with that. No problem. Other than voting to 
when I approved the full ordinance. I wish I could address that because I was on the ordinance committee, but it's so long ago now that I don't recall. I remember it had to do with Ken Cole's recommendation, but I don't recall um, anything beyond that, what, that, what his rationale was. Yes, yep. Jessica. I, I agree as well. I mean, it, you know, we had hired um, Ken Cole at the time. Um, the other uh, change since then is that at the time that the Spurwin Garden Gun Club was an open range. It is no longer an open range. <clears throat> to me, that's a very huge difference. Well, it's half so, and half. Now. Pardon? It's half and half now. Well, we have the, the 25 yard range is covered. Yeah. You mean the 50 and the 100 still? They are closed. It, the range can't be. They, they're not, they're not allowed to, they can only fire in the 25 yard range because that is enclosed. They, they will be applying in the future for, for a permit to operate on the, in those other yardage ranges when those have been built and covered. If LD150 doesn't preempt that. Correct. And I, let's stop that conversation right now because I, I want to ask our attorney to weigh in on that, but I want to finish the, the question we had on the table about the $3 million or the history of that coming out of the Ordinance Committee. Anybody else? Michael, do you remember anything about that? Do you know where that came from? No? Okay. But Jessica, what you're suggesting is I that... I was just saying that I, that I recall it was the recommendation of Mr. Cole and the Ordinance Committee um, went along with that. Um, but again, at the time, it, at the time, it was a completely open range. That's no longer the case. Right, and you're talking about the fact that it's now a no blue sky right. range, yeah, on, at least on the 25 yard yeah. range. Okay, yeah. great. Other questions? Anybody on this side of the table? Yes, James. Some point of clarification for the attorney. Um, so the uh, eight provisions for hardship, it is a and, not or. Correct. stipulation right so all of these have to apply that's correct thank you thank you any other questions yes Sarah sorry I'm taking up too much air time no nope, go ahead um, I for me whether those other two ranges are gonna have to fall under the, the current ordinance or not is a huge factor in this and I don't yet understand LD 1500 enough to know whether that state law is gonna sort of unshackle them from that requirement or whether they want to do it anyway or what the tension is personally i feel unready to vote on this because there it's there's still too many moving pieces here unless we can understand ld1500 more more would you like to speak to that to sarah's question about the 50 and 100 yard ranges and and the approval process for licensing them under ld1500 um yes uh, <clears throat> So I think the way it plays out, as I said, is there, um, for example, today there's a conditional or limited license issued to Spurwink to the 25-yard shooting range portion of their premises. Only those operations are currently allowed under the license that was issued. That's my understanding. Um, if they wish to open more target ranges, um, longer target ranges, um, I think the code enforcement officer for, has to find that has met the standards of the ordinance, the containment safety standards of the ordinance. Um, the um, La Rosa report accepted by this town found that it did not meet the shock containment um, requirements of the ordinance. And then it later met the 25 yard range shot containment. So I think they still need to reach to meet shot containment requirements of the ordinance. And I don't think that's changed by state law because the state law states it either has to uh, conform uh, to the generally accepted shooting range practices or be constructed so as not to allow a projectile to leave the range. When I read that the first time, I said, why either or? What's, what is the legislature trying to do here? Because I, I really wasn't quite sure why it was written in the uh, disjunctive. And I looked at it more carefully, and it said, when I think about it, you could have 
a totally enclosed shooting range in this room with 10-foot walls and it's constructed so that a projectile may not leave this room. Don't have to come forward, the applicant does not have to come forward and show that the practices uh, are met, the, the practice standard, the generally accepted range practices. You know, on the other hand, um, maybe in uh, Aroostook County, 10 miles from a neighbor, and the range isn't constructed to meet any standards. But the operation meets the generally accepted safety practices. So it seems to me that, you know, a range could come under either of those two standards and say, I meet these standards and a town cannot regulate me in a way that limits or eliminates our ability to do what we have historically done. Jamie. Do you have a definition of hardship that we should be using? No, I looked before I came. Um, no, I really, I, I'm not being wise. I, I thought that might be asked. Um, I think it's going to be common sense. There really isn't a lot. There are certain areas like undue hardship. Uh, uh, we have in uh, zoning various matters. Um, we speak of um, hardships in, uh, well, there's, there's no, uh, there's no undue, there's no great, it's, it's hardship. So I think it's a relative term. Um, we, in the financial uh, arena, if we're talking about the financial costs of this insurance versus that insurance, personally I think I would look at um, what the cost difference is, maybe what the total dues are, what the cost uh, increase has been to, it would be rather to meet the, uh, um, the, the, the requirement of $3 million per occurrence uh, liability coverage. It's a relative term. You know, I'm not, uh, well, I think it's relative to the person who applies to show you and make sure you're satisfied that they've met that standard. I think it's a common sense. Is it a hardship for them to pay these additional funds to get additional insurance? Question for um, Ms. Walter and Mr. Mayo. Uh, how many dues paying members are there? Thank you. Yes. Tammy, could you come up to the microphone? Thank you. I was just adding that up. Um, we had... Put you on the spot for public math. <laughs> uh, last year we had 325 members. Because of our ranges being closed, we've lost about 100 members. Because at our last meeting we had 222 members. A year ago we increased our dues from 65 to 75, but for anyone over 65, we kept it at $65. So I'm going to go by 222 times 75 and whatever 16, that comes out to, 16,000? 16, 16, That's our annual dues. And we have a few fundraisers like raffles that bring in, you know, and a couple of people that donate here and there. So, you know, I'd say maybe another 5,000 a year, something like that. So am I correct that it's approximately $13 per member on this difference? Say that again? So the, the difference that we're talking about is $7,100 premium versus 4200 correct? Yes. Approximately? Yes. And the 222 members, I think if my math is right, that works out to about $13 per member. Um, the, what's the $13 per member? Sorry. So there's a $2,900 difference between the two premium yes. prices? Yes, yes. So to cover that $2,900 divided by your 222 members would be about $13 per member. You, if I was going to charge them more, I don't, yeah. yeah. That would be very, very hard to do. I know it seems like not a lot of money. Just putting it in context. That's to all. ask people for, but we've asked them for so much. And, you know, we've asked, I mean, we had the entire, I mean, members come and give up their vacation time there's, I mean, summer last year. I mean, we've done so much. We've asked a lot of people. And we have a lot of people that are just on, older and on a fixed income. And Yes, Jessica. Thank you. So what I calculate is <clears throat> at $4,200 a year 
for one million. Yes. In coverage per uh, per event is fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand four hundred dollars. Am I right? Not forty two hundred times twelve. No, it's forty two hundred dollars per year. When we had a million dollars, have to drop a year. off zero. Our uh, our cost was forty two hundred, and now it's seventy one. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Forty two hundred. Well, oh, yikes. The difference is approximately twenty nine hundred dollars, about three thousand dollars. Thank you, Jamie. Did you have another question? Nope. Thank you, Caitlin. I had a question for Tom. Um, if you issue the, the hardship, is it for the life of the club, or do you do we limit it to year to year since the ordinance will still state three million? How would you? Good question. I would think it'd be year to year. I think it'd be. So um, they have to reapply for the hardship every year. I believe so. Yes, I think it would be part of their application. They would be asking for an exception to the specific insurance requirement. Right. I have a question. Is the timing of asking for this hardship because of are your dues for your insurance due soon? I mean, when when is your calendar on that, Tammy? Excuse me, Patty. Is the the your policy? Are you due to pay your policy soon? The fact that you're here now to deal with this, um, the the change from you know three million to one million. Are you looking to just clear it up, or is it something that you have to? It's time sensitive is what I'm getting. No, I don't think it's time sensitive. I, 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 I'm not really sure, but I think we pay it by quarterly. I'm, I don't really know. Okay. Yes. Um, does that, will the NRA provide the insurance if, if, if we agree to do one million? No, I don't think I'll go to the NRA. I just, I like having the local, we use Noise Allen and, and I like, like having him right there to go to. Okay, so the NRA is not really a factor in this. It's not like they're going to help you pay for the insurance. Or anything. No, the only reason why we brought up the NRA is because we went to them to get insurance when our insurance was canceled, when the people in the neighborhood got involved in that. So we called them to see if we could get insurance because we didn't know if we could get new insurance. And we were just scrambling around. And that's when we found out that they don't even offer it as high as the town was asking us to go. One more question. Mm -hmm. um, are you concerned that if you were to get sued um, and it went above a million that the the consequences of that would be um, so damaging to your club, i.e., you know, what he was saying about you might have to sell off all your land and so forth. Does that make you worried enough that, it, that, that you've thought about that, the difference between essentially four and seven, three thousand dollars a year to give you peace of mind. I mean, I guess that's sort of what insurance is for. If I were you guys, I think I might be concerned that one accident could shut you down. Do, are you worried about that? No, not at all. Why? Because I know how safe we are. I see it every day. I mean, we have guns in our hands. We think about safety all the time. It's what we talk about at every meeting. It's what we think about all the time. It's, I'm not concerned at all. Other questions? Caitlin? I was just going to point out, I mean, it's liability insurance. So if somebody slips and falls because they're clumsy, they can't just sue the gun club. Like the gun club has to have done something to allow them to be sued. That's what Tom was trying to say about the town. We'd have to do something to have caused us to be drawn into the lawsuit. So just to put in a, an, an extra legal cue, they can't just be sued for existing. They have to be sued for being negligent in some way, as would we. Any other council members have questions? No? I have a couple, Tom, if you could come back up. Um, I know you mentioned it a little earlier. Anyone can sue anyone for any reason. And I thought that was a very helpful comment that Caitlin just made about the town's involvement in any liability lawsuit and understanding that we put aside anything that was frivolous because we can't insure against that anyway. Um, can you envision any situation where the town would have liability that we 
would not be held harmless for? I, I can. I see you licensing a facility. I mean, it's an existing facility. It's existed since 1956, and it would have to establish the town has done something to create liability for the town. Right. I think this was designed to protect uh, you know, the public to some degree. Again, I wasn't there when this came up as an as an as a part. I understand. Um, <laughs> yeah. Please, go Mike. Go ahead. Just as an example. It, it, we, we don't have our police officers do their shooting there. But if they did do their shooting there and something happened, we could get sued. That would be an example. Okay. But we don't. We, we do not. Right now, our, our uh, police officers go to another shooting range. Okay. Okay. And I, but the I'm, same thing could happen at that shooting range. <laughs> right. And you could get, we could get sued for that. Yeah, you could. Yeah, I, I serve on the board of an, of a, of an insurance company uh, as a volunteer. I don't get paid for it. Yep. And, you know, we, we have meetings and we go over all the different large claims. And, you know, so, fortunately, Maine isn't that bad. But in, in some states, you know, it, it, they, they sue it, everyone and everyone, anyone and everyone. And it's really difficult to get yourself thrown out of the case. Uh, you know, they, it, it takes a lot of money. A lot of settlement discussion, but you know, fortunately, Maine, I think, is a little more reasonable in that regard, uh, in terms of uh, getting rid of the frivolity of individuals who are attached to cases where they really don't belong. But it, but it can happen. Okay. Any other comments, questions? I think we have a motion on the table right now, and maybe Deborah could read it back to us. We do. We, it's moved by Councilor Jordan, seconded by Councilor Lennon, to reduce the required minimum liability insurance from $3 million per occurrence to $1 million per occurrence. Kathy. Should we not um, ask for an amendment to include all this? Read my mind. Sorry. Would you like to make that amendment? Uh, shouldn't it be the, Does the individual? Caitlin need to amend it? Amend it to include the findings? Is that yes. you're saying? Yes. Um, so, I amend my motion to reduce the insurance liability from $3 million per occurrence to $1 million per occurrence with the following findings. That the hard, number one, the hardship results from the literal application on the specific provisions of the ordinance. Two, the hardship relates to the applicant's specific shooting range, which predates the ordinance. Three, the hardship was not self-induced or self-created by the applicant after the effective date of the ordinance. Four, the hardship is particular to the applicant's shooting range in that it is only current licensed shooting range in town. Five, there is unique conditions pertaining to the applicant's shooting range, it having existed in the town at its current location since 1950s. Six, imposing the $3 million per occurrence liability coverage given the cost and availability of such greater insurance and the limited revenues and assets of the applicant would likely deprive the applicant of its right to continue to operate its existing facility. Seven, reducing the required $3 million per occurrence liability coverage to $1 million per occurrence liability coverage will not materially affect the safety of the surrounding neighborhoods or the general public welfare as the applicant's current operations, limited to its 25-yard range, has been determined to meet the town safety standards. And number eight, the requested reduction in insurance coverage does not serve to eliminate the ordinance requirement of a licensed range to maintain liability insurance, and reducing the applicant's insurance requirement to $1 million is the minimum allowed reduction to allow for the continued operation of the applicant's range. Thank you. And do we also need Councillor Lennon to second that amended motion? Second. Thank you. Discussion about the amended motion. Yes. I've got a one last section that you, know, oh, you didn't read that it probably should. <laughs> well, it's not. It's just based it's upon just, the findings yeah. the applicant's request for an amendment to its current license to operate its range by reducing its required minimum liability insurance from $3 million per occurrence to $1 million per occurrence is granted. Thank you. Comments? No? Yes. No. I'm, I'm in support of this. I think it's reasonable. 
Um, there is only the 25-yard range, and which is covered, and the club has met the standards. I see no reason not to grant this. Thank you. Anyone else? Jamie? Um, I think that, the, uh, you know, judging by the history on this, it sounds like the $3 million level, as was, I think somebody used the word arbitrary. I can't remember if it was you, Mr. Leahy, but that all being said, I'm, I'm very stuck on um, the notion of hardship here. Um, and believe me, I am very um, impressed by the amount of work that your membership and others and volunteers have done and the burden that you've bared to do that. Um, I, I, I think you guys have bent over backwards to do that. And I, I do not discount what you've already asked your members to do. Um, but the, the whole notion of hardship here um, is, is what's really, what, I, what I'm really struggling. So I, I think the $3 million amount was probably incorrect to begin with, and now you're sort of being forced to live with that, um, sh unless the ordinance itself changes. But the definition of hardship, um, to me, is where I'm stuck on actually supporting this. Thank you. Anyone else? Sarah? I would echo Jamie's sentiments that I really appreciate the lengths that the club has gone to to, um, to not only address the requests of the committee but even go above and beyond. I, I actually went down there and toured it the other day. I was very impressed with the 25-yard range. They, they spent more money and they did it really, really well. Um, so I guess my feeling is I would love to see this money put toward more of that work. Um, it seems m like a more practical use of funds to spend every dollar they have toward making those other ranges as safe and as quiet um, so that this, the, the, this lawsuit <laughs> and this insurance will never have to be used. Uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So um, I understand what you're saying, Jamie, that it's, it's a little tough to squeeze it into this definition. I would love to know um, what the Ordinance Committee was thinking when they did the 3,000, but I'm guessing that what Jessica said was that it was then that open range that, that, that the inspector did find to be dangerous. And now that all of that has been addressed, it feels to me um, less, less um, critical. And so I would just encourage the gun range to continue the great work that they've started. Um, and I, any way that we can help them do that, I, I want to. Thank you. Patty? I guess I would just now echo um, what you just said the last statement. And Jessica's, I think when the arbitrary number of um, the three million was set is when you didn't have the, the no blue sky and there wasn't all this work done and I think it's um, it's fair to assume that it is um, a much much safer range um, and it's fair to um, support these new findings and the reduction. Thank you. Jamie? Uh, well I, I don't want to speak before others have had a chance to speak first. I, I do have another point. I, I was curious. just flagging there for you. Okay. I, I guess then what I question is why are we not considering changing the ordinance? Um, it, it, it appears the spirit of what we're trying to do here and, and what most people are in agreement with is that a million dollars is sufficient based on the new configuration of the range and the current use. Um, I, I, I am not comfortable with the idea that this is a hardship exception. I am more than comfortable with the idea that a million dollars is sufficient insurance and I agree with what's been said about um, you know, good work being done, put more resources to doing more good work. But the, the way the ordinance reads is relief of hardship, which, which I, I don't think this is an example of that. So I, I just question why we're not looking at redoing the ordinance. Thank you. I think the manager would like to weigh in on that. Well, sort of, but sort of indirectly, you know, I, I think, you know, you need to consider the hardship, you have an application for hardship, you consider it one way or the other. Uh, but, you know, but the, the other issue that uh, Council Garvin's raised is, is whether or not the Ordinance Committee ought to look at uh, uh, the ordinance and, and what is the, the proper need for insurance. And, you know, and I think particularly as you look at LD 1500, you know, the, the, the Ordinance Committee is now looking at the very narrow issue 
of what the, how the committee should be made up. Uh, and we don't want that issue to get mixed up with this one because that's a, a part of a lot of other issues that have nothing to do with the fire and range committee. But I would think that knowing that LD 1500 is about to become law, that you, you ought to at some point refer to the ordinance committee uh, responsibility for looking at the fire and range ordinance and uh, seeing if it, it needs any updates or changes. And I think it's also particularly good to do after you've gone through a first round of, of uh, permitting and, and using it. So would we make that motion this evening or put it on the agenda for next month's totally meeting? Up, whatever discussion? the council wishes to do. Okay. And right now, really I'm getting stuck in the mud again <laughs> on Robert's rules, rules, but right now we have Caitlin's amended motion, which is to vote on this language that Tom Leahy has provided us tonight. <clears throat> yes. You know, I, I, there's no hurry on it. I would suggest it be on the June agenda for potential referral. Thank you. And I, I, is everyone else done commenting? Any other comments, questions? Um, my only concern with this as written is that um, when we talked a little earlier about the possibility of the year-to-year -year understanding of the um, insurance regulation and the licensing associated with it, I'm not clear, and Tom, maybe you can respond to this, I'm not clear that that, that provision exists in the language as it's written right now. So if we would like this to be required for uh, review annually, do we need to amend this language or amend this motion to incorporate that? Um, <clears throat> I think it's clear that the existing license that runs for one year uh, from when it was issued, um, there's an exception that you're voting on tonight, period. And when they reapply, I think it's fair game to apply the ordinance as it then exists subject to LD 1500. I don't think um, I don't think the grandfather to say we meet the hardship and we'll always meet the hardship. Okay. I think I think my interpretation is as drafted they it's just silent with what happens next time. And and when they apply I think the review would be under the ordinance that exists and the application would re have to request an exception in state why. Okay. And then, and then support why, by testimony or by evidence. We would have to do that at that time. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Are we ready to vote? Yes, all in favor of the motion as amended and read by Caitlin and written up by Tom Leahy. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. You got that? We do. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we'll just take a brief recess here for a couple of minutes. If we could come back at quarter of, that works. Good. Stretch break. Yep. Take a quick stretch.
right, we will move on to item number 78, the appointments to voter registration appeals board. And Deborah, could you introduce that item for us? I'd be happy to. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the many election laws we have requires a town to have a registration appeals board. Uh, if someone is aggrieved by the decision of the registrar, they may, may appeal to the board. The law requires that each of the major municipal parties uh, make a recommendation for a member and an alternate. Uh, which both the Democratic and the Republican town committees have done. Uh, the third member of the committee uh, is the chairman that is recommended by the clerk. That has already been taken care of. We are fortunate to have Andy and E. Swift Kayata, who already serves as a chairman of the board uh, for a term to expire April 14th, 2018. This evening you have before you the nominations of Nolan Reichel, and Karen Hessel, uh, Janet Corey, and Tim Thompson. Uh, again, uh, recommendations from the major political parties. Their terms would be effective immediately to expire May 9th, 2019. Thank you. Could I have a motion to accept? Yes, Kathy. I move that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council confirms nominations to the Registration Appeals Board as presented. The terms are effective immediately to expire May 9th, 2019. Thank you. Is there a second on that? Thank you, Patty. Discussion? Any comments? Questions? No? All in favor? That is unanimous. We will move on to item number 79, Scott Dyer Road Paving Grant Request. Michael, would you like to introduce that item? Yeah. The, uh, Scott Dyer Road is one of the few roads that the state might help with paving, and they've offered us a grant of $247,000 to pave uh, Scott Day Road between Route 77 and what we would call Lower Brentwood Road that circles around, so it's the, the further one. Uh, this would probably be what's known as a mill and fill, where you scoop up the existing paving and you put down the new paving. Uh, along with this, we, we would also be looking at trying to improve the sidewalks, uh, make those uh, nice or all at local expense. Uh, the state wouldn't pay for that. And, uh, you know, and we're hoping also to get it moved up to 2018 rather than 2019. The road's in pretty tough shape. The good news is they're offering a grant of 240, about $247,000. That's great. So you're asking, did, uh, PACS requires local councils to endorse the projects before any more, before they really get started with planning. Okay. So we will be looking for a motion to accept that grant. To, to in, endorse the, the, the grant request for 247000 Thank you. Can I have a motion? Thank you, Jessica. So move. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. And any discussion or questions? No? I have one quick question, and I'm looking at the email that came along with us in our packet, and it says, uh, and this must be from PAX, I think it says, we need to get your council's endorsement for a short list of projects. That's great. And it's not a commitment to provide the local share, which is good. No. We're not committing to that to the future. Uh, but rather a statement of council support for these potential projects. The first official council commitment to provide the local share comes later at the signing of the three-party no. agreement. My question is, how long does it take us to get there? In other words, is, will we be voting on this again yes. before 2000 and 18. Yes. Okay. You look at the plan, and sometimes, with, with, you know, I'll ask you, I'll put something in saying, and the manager's authorized to sign anything that needs to be signed. I think it's way too mature to do that because you, you really haven't seen the scope of the project. Right. It hasn't been defined yet. Okay. And, and we do want to do some sidewalk work and, and other things around the same time this is done. Great. Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Nope. That's unanimous. Thank you. We will move on to item number 80, the acceptance of the sculpture. Michael, would you like to yep. introduce this item? The, uh, there's a provision in state law that uh, communities, local councils need to accept gifts. And uh, usually we do that in December in, in one, one vote, but occasionally other gifts come up. And sculptures tend to have been very politically sensitive in a lot of communities. And so, and, and furthermore, uh, this would require an amendment to the site plan for the library. And in order for me to apply to the planning board, 
I can only do that with a council authorization. So what, what I'm requesting is that you authorize the town manager to accept the gift of the sculpture and to submit an application to the planning board for an amendment to the approved site plan for Tosmer Mayor Library. And if you look at that sculpture, you know, where it's underlined in, in the text, that would actually take you to what the, what the library foundation is pro proposing. Uh, there's two pictures there. It's the same sculpture. It's just different angles. Uh, but it's, you know, good size. It would be a big concrete base. It would go, as you're looking at the library entrance, it would be between that and the pathway that leads down to the school playground. Thank you. Could I have a motion? Thank you, Jessica. I move we accept. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I move that we authorize the town manager to accept the gift of the sculpture of the sculpture and to submit an application to the planning board for an amendment to the approved site plan for the Thomas Morrow Library. Thank you. Is there a second, Caitlin? Sure. And then I have a question. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, when I think gift, I think somebody gave it to us, but I'm just trying to make sure I understand the reading. The library building committee purchased this with funds from the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation. Is that? Thomas Memorial Library Foundation will buy it. We are accepting the gift of the sculpture. Okay. The, if I could just clarify that, Caitlin. Before the Library Building Committee completed its work, we had a series of discussions about a piece of art to go on the exterior of the building or on the lot adjacent to the building. We, several of us on the Building Committee, went to visit a number of artists and saw a number of pieces of art, several of which we liked and approved. We had a long discussion about what should go there and where it should go and how it should be installed. We started um, about a year ago doing that. By the end of November, we were ready to recommend a particular piece of artwork, which the architects had worked with us on and had recommended as well. But it was the end of November, and the ground was about to freeze, and there would be site work involved in moving this process forward, and we knew we'd need to go back to the planning board. So the library building committee decided to defer that until the spring, and the foundation still has funds available for the library project. So we're kind of closing the loop here. We're back where we started almost a year ago. We're finally ready with the proposal. We'd like to see it move forward. And, yeah, I just wanted to make sure it was clear that you know somebody's not just giving us this sculpture that research went into it and it was selected. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Any other comments or questions? No? All in favor? Thank you. That is unanimous. And we will move on to item number 82, the use of pesticides on municipal property. Sarah, would you like to oh, 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 so, oh, how could I skip right over paper streets and Maureen's the only person left in the, <laughs> in the audience here? Sorry. <laughs> we'll move on to number 81. Paper Street update. We have received extensive public input on Paper Streets. Um, Michael, are you introducing this, or would we like Maureen to come up and introduce this item? Uh, Maureen is prepared. To, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, and since we don't have a large audience here, uh, you know, the, the, the hope is that is that uh, you would discuss this at your workshop, the primary topic on on May 19th. Uh, Maureen has has provided you a number of handouts, all of which are online. But because they're thick documents or long spreadsheets, uh, we, we gave you paper copies. And I know some of you don't love paper copies, but it's, reviewing something this complicated, it, it, it's good to do that. Uh, you know, speaking for the, uh, you know, I understand the council chairman would like the councilors to do a little homework, and you might you might address that. My note says town council homework on it. Yes. Um, I think before I mention that, we probably need a motion, uh, which is to move this to a workshop on May 19th, 2016. So moved. Thank you. Caitlin, do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, so. Yeah, yes. just if I could wrap up. Look, I really do want to acknowledge there were four uh, meetings. That, uh, well, why don't you come up, Maureen? Well, yes, Maureen, can you come up and talk to us a little bit about that? This won't the take process long. process that we've been through that's brought us to this point. So the two-minute summary? Mm -hmm. Sure. All right, so 1997, council extended your paper streets for 20 years. 
Fast forward 20 years, you're almost out of your extension. So you have a brand new 2015 Paper Streets report. You received that in February last year. And of the pile of stuff in front of you, that's the one on the bottom. Um, and after you received that report, you decided on a public engagement plan. And that public engagement plan said part one, review by the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission. Those two reviews were completed by the end of J July 2015. Part two was holding neighborhood meetings. And four neighborhood meetings were held. Uh, January, February, March 30th was the last one of this year. And those meetings were all well attended. We sent total about 2,000 notices out. Uh, and there were meeting notes of each of those meetings. Each of those meeting notes are in the newer package. So the newer package includes some extra pages of the original 2015 report because when we had those public meetings, they were very valuable in that people pointed out paper streets that got left off of the 2015 report. So there's some replacement pages and some additional pages. And you can tell because they have decimal points in the page numbers. Uh, and then your final phase is to hold a public hearing. And my understanding is that prior to doing that, um, you need to, as a council, think about what your recommendation is as part of the workshop. Anything else? No. Anyone have any questions for Maureen about the process that we've been through to date? No? Okay. And Maureen, this pa packet that says Town Council Homework, I have one for each council member to hand out. And um, you'll see it as I hand it along to you. I'll just hand some of those out. What I'd like to suggest is that if we do indeed move this along to the workshop on May 19th, that prior to that workshop, it would be really helpful since this is a fair, it's been a fairly extensive process and there are a number of these streets on the list. It would be really helpful if people prior to that meeting could take a walk through the spreadsheet take a look at the recommendations from the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board, and they've given us, um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Maureen, I think they are in agreement on all of these streets, on either retaining or vacating. Except for Thompson Road. OK. So it would be helpful if council members could take a look at this specifically, and um, you'll see in the far right-hand columns, there are three options, town council extend, town council accept, town council vacate. If you could come to the meeting on the 19th, having looked through this list and the, um, the two documents, the May 3rd Paper Streets memo and the 2015 Paper Street report, and come prepared with uh, your comments on accepting or vacating or extending the rights on these that would be very helpful and would keep us moving forward, I think, rather than getting us too bogged down in the process. Hold on one second, Jessica. I think Caitlin had her hand up first. Just, I see three um, different properties that there Stony Brook, Thompson, and Allen Road that have different retain and vacate. Okay. Yep. And we'll see the, the um, background on that as we look through this report and the list of comments. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Jessica, did you have a question? Yeah. This appears to be the same one that's in our packet. Mm -hmm. It is. I want to confirm. Okay. I promise it's Just the exact same extra one. Just copy. Okay. okay. Can I ask Maureen a question? Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. This might be a really stupid question, but um, lot access, an X means there's no access to this. Street? What it means is we, we evaluated paper streets under a variety of factors. And one of the factors we looked at was, is there an existing lot of record that would no longer have vehicular access if the paper street was vacated? So every place under lot access where you see there an X, that means that you need to keep that paper street because you will make a lot landlocked if you let it be vacated. Okay, so, and the other c column I had a question was utility. With these that numbers. was if there are any utilities in the paper street currently, so water lines, sewer lines, storm drain lines, storm drain ditches, um, 
if it has something there, it, we've identified it as, yes, having utility. And I also tried to put linear feet so you could get the idea of how much utility is in the road. So. Helpful. Kathy. Um, and if I try to remember that if this is correct, but if we extend it, we extend it for another 20 years. If we accept it, we're done. It's whatever decision we've made, it, it doesn't have to be redone in 20 years. Am, am I correct? Right. And you, you're, you're allowed, under the current law, you're allowed two 20-year extensions. So if you extend anything now in 2037, um, you have to, you're not allowed to extend anymore. You would have to let it go or accept it. And the original discussion, the assumption was you would either let things go, which is vacate, or you would extend. But there were a number of people at the, at the neighborhood meetings who started saying, why do we keep talking about this? Why, why don't we just accept it? So if you choose accept, we have a little bit of legal work to do on exactly how we do that. But we don't put this off to another poor council in another 20 years. That would be the advantage. Thank you. And the last thing, accepting is basically the same um, instead of for retain, correct? It's, it's, I mean, excuse me, it's like it's extending. permanently retained versus retained for the next 20 years. So, I mean, extending is the same as retaining. Correct. Yeah, yeah. When you're using the word extend. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, is the state reviewing this issue? You mean in terms of legislation or what we do as a, as a town? I mean, in terms of legislation, is there some conversation in Augusta about There is usually, and Michael is a good person to talk about this, there's usually Paper Street legislation of some kind, and it's not Paper Street at the state, it's, it's uh, abandoned roads. There's usually something submitted every session, and it tends to focus on a small town in northern Maine with a property, a couple who own property on a street that's been abandoned. So. There hasn't been legislation that seems to directly apply to this extension stuff in a while. That doesn't mean that it couldn't. Other questions on this? No? Okay. So uh, we have a motion to move this to workshop on May 19th. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Any opposed? No? Unanimous. All right. We will move on to use of pesticides on municipal properties. Yes. Do you want me to introduce Yes, them? I do. Please. Um, so I'll be very brief because of the time. But essentially, uh, if you guys remember, our, our current goal um, says Consider banning the use of all. Consider banning the use of all pesticides on town-owned property. Um, I met with Bob Malley. We had a great meeting. He was incredibly informative and helpful. And essentially, he described to me um, that that goal is close to impossible um, because <laughs> Caitlin's smiling. Because um, there are occasions when uh, when organic products cannot address the issue both pesticides and herbicides, for example, grubs, or there's some infestation in the middle of the field, and the only way to get rid of them before they ruin the entire field is to use um, a non-organic substance. So I, I completely heard what he was saying. And he also said that um, he believes he's very much in favor of moving toward organics. He said it's the way everyone's going. Organic products are getting better and better, and, and prices are dropping, and he is all in favor of moving. But he counseled. Um, me that we should do it patiently and a bit slowly. First of all, it costs more, as he told us at the budget meeting, about 30 percent more. It co more manpower, you have to do more to the field, um, and, and the products are still more costly. But, but they're making great progress. Um, he, he's been working on Gullcrest, the upper field, for several years. He thinks that it's still doing fine. It's not quite as bright green as the others, and so that's a little bit of public education that you can't, it's like when you buy an organic apple, it doesn't look perfect, but um, it's healthy and it's workable, and so they're now gonna add to the list the lower Gullcrest field and the Fort Williams field. They've also stopped using um, synthetic herbicides in the park, 
on those all those bushes, all those beds of flowers, which is great. And they've stopped in the baseball field. They're now using organics on that, which again takes more time, but he feels good about it. So um, to make a long story short, essentially what he suggested, and which I wholeheartedly agree with, is that we. Um, that we moderately alter our goal to read something like increase the use of, increase the use of organic products throughout town or gradually replace um, synthetic with organic or something that implies a bit more of a process because I think that to get all the way there will take several years. Um, so my motion is that we accept this great report he's written up that's very thorough and uh, very informative for anyone in the public who's interested in this issue that we accept it and we, um, we, we um, yeah, that we essentially proceed, maybe we can tweak our, our wording on our goal a little bit, but essentially we've met the goal and I think that it makes sense to review this every year for future town councils, maybe as part of the budget process that he reports on how much it's costing and what progress he's making. So that was kind of a long look. Sorry. And that's OK. So I move that we accept this report from uh, Robert Malley and um, proceed as outlined. Thank you. Proceed as Subject outlined to the in the report. Review. Subject to annual review during the budget. Um, to review sections of the budget for field maintenance. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Patty. Any discussion? I'd just like to thank Bob for all the work he's doing on this. It's, 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 it adds to his already full workload, but I think it's important. Um, and he, he, he's really embraced it. That's great. OK. All in favor? Any opposed? That is unanimous. We will move on to item number 83. Michael, are you coming back up here? Okay. Either one, whichever is better for you. This is the library project budget update. Uh, thank you, Chairman Coslin. Yeah, I think it's important whenever you do a large project that you give a final accounting of how everything came out and, what, 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 and this is what that is. You know, the library projects, it, it's a little complicated with all the financing because we had monies that were, that were approved by the citizen, uh, 4.2 million, plus there were earlier monies that were also approved for uh, work on the Spurwing School in order to make it a temporary library, as well as a lot of old funds uh, that uh, uh, had been set aside for some of the, the, the earlier referendum that didn't, of that, those plans that weren't approved. But the long and short of it is, is that uh, the construction cost uh, ended up being just under $4 million, 3.998. Uh, the amount that the citizens had authorized was 4.2 million. But if you look at everything, you look at the, the, what we call the soft costs, the architect's fees and the, the temporary storage trailers. You look at the work that was done in, underground to make the Spurwing, the Spurwing School uh, have better utilities, new sewer lines. Uh, you look at all the furnishings that were donated uh, by, the, by the citizens to the uh, Thomas Moyer Library Foundation. Overall, it, it's about a $5 million project, $5.1 million. Uh, but, but still, there's about $83,000 left. Uh, in the account that remains in the, the Spurwing Church, uh, Spurwing Church, Spurwing School, Spurwing School. Uh, renovation account that's available, you know, conceivably for the use of the, the, the following whatever recommendations that committee comes up with. Uh, but overall, the, the, the finance of the project uh, are, are on target, online, and, you know, a lot was accomplished uh, for considerably less than the first referendum. Uh, was that was defeated. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know it's a little complicated following all the numbers, but these are, if anyone is watching and wants to look at the numbers, uh, if they, you, they go to the council packet for this item, uh, there is a link to the, the spreadsheet the council has in front of it with all, the, with all the different numbers. But I think the other thing to look at is when you look at a project, you know, people look at what the construction cost is. There's an awful lot of other costs to a project. Uh, architects fees, in this case, just the moving fees alone of moving the books and everything from one library to the next was about $35,000. Uh, so, you know, costs add up. But the news is good overall. Good. Very important, generous donation on furnishing stuff. So. And, you know, if you look at the, 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 the direct construction was about $3.6 but even about 80000 of that was paid for by the furnishings account, 
where there was certain there were upgrades of the the, the entryway was fancier than and they paid for some of the upgrades of, of, of the granite that you see there. They paid for the stage outside that came out of that 3.6 million, uh, but, but then, then was reimbursed. Right. Some of the mill work on the desk. Some of the fancier mill work, yeah. The, the wave down in the, on the ceiling of the children's, for instance, that was an add-on that was paid for by the foundation. Anyone have any questions on that? Jessica? I guess I had thought that the architect fees were in, were all in the, uh, the, the bonded amount. Yeah, and they're in, they're in the soft costs, they're in the bond. <coughs> yeah, okay. So just yeah, but the, except for a little bit of it was the charge to furnish a very little bit. The, all the costs for the, for example, the furnishings consultant uh, that worked with the architect were charged to uh, the furnishings side of the ledger, and that was paid for by the Tosmer Library Foundation. Correct. And the, if I may, and the, uh, uh, I know there were startup costs with the architects, but I'm, I'm uh, assuming that those were in the 250. That's right. 240 that were paid back. That's we, right. We did. Yeah. With the, with the planning committee. Yeah. We had to fund. Well, we, we had to fund that, that architect we had from Pennsylvania for the previous project. And, right. Yeah. But I mean, uh, even with, uh, uh, with Dick Reed, we funded, we were funding him with the planning committee. But that's out of the 240. That's 000. right. We, yes, we, that's we, the total amount. Reed and Company was the architect. Yeah. They gave us a proposal. The, their final fee was in keeping yeah. with that original proposal. There were some add-ons for uh, Nadine, who worked with them, who was the furnishings consultant. Those were paid for uh, by the furnishings budget. And then there was also, in addition to the soft costs, like the copies of plans, the printing costs, postage costs. Every time you get a bill, there's all those little add-ons that, you know, original contract provided add-ons. You know, it adds up after you get a project that goes on for a couple of years. Caitlin, did you have a question? No? I had a question. The almost $83,000 remaining, um, while I'm guessing it will be likely to be used for something for the school, depend the Spurring School, depending on what that committee comes back with, um, what's the process for reappropriating that if it's not used? Right now, $25,000 of it was specifically allocated to the Spurwick School Committee. That there was a line. So that's that already out of the committee. That's out of that would come out of that money. Okay, so 83, 83 less 25. So yeah, so there'd be okay. that slightly additional sum. 82.68. And you could also notice I also kept $25,000 in uh, for the library. Uh, you know, in case that there's, there's other minor issues. There's there's a few issues with some plantings that. Uh, a roof garden that might cause a little money, and I'm not sure where that's coming from. That conceivably could come out of that, and uh, there's uh, could be other minor issues, but not that relate to construction. But just you get into a project, get into it six months, and you know, I wish they had done that or whatever. Uh, that's why we're still holding twenty-five thousand. So I'm sorry, I don't know if I caught the answer or not about it. so less the twenty-five thousand that's already been. It's eighty-three minus twenty-five. Right. So of the remaining of that, though. Yeah, I didn't, if, I didn't, it doesn't that, get used. It, how does it go back into being reappropriated? If it, it, it would lapse into the general fund, okay. uh, you know, my recommendation is when we do the carry forward balance, is probably in July, those monies are being carried forward, not knowing what's happening. Right. Uh, you know, the what the charter says is money staying in, in, in an account for the purpose for which it was intended has been accomplished. That's what I'm getting to. Thank you. Uh, the council has to define what that means right. in any given case. Any other questions? No? Thank you. And do we Thank need you. to do anything with this? Do we need to accept your report? Just or? acknowledge receipt, accept it, whatever. Okay. Could I have a motion to acknowledge receipt of the update on the library project finances? So moved. Patty. Thank you. Second? Thank you, Patty. Any discussion on that? No? All in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you for the update. Uh, at this point, citizens may raise any topic not on the agenda. Since we have no citizens here, we will move on to item number 84, and I need a motion for us to move into executive session. Would someone like to make that motion? Yeah, just a suggestion. I no longer have anything on C unless the, it's someone from the council does. So, you know, the motion only needs to be F. 
<clears throat> Would someone like to make that motion? We can just read it right into the, yes, thank you. Just me, okay. yes. Uh, I move that uh, executive, uh, item number 84, executive session to review hardship abatement of property taxes. D, discussion of information contained in records name, records made, maintained, or received by a body or agency when access by the general public to those records is prohibited by statute. In this instance, a review of a hardship tax abatement request made under 36 MRSA subsection 841. And I, I think just to stay on track, we need to reference back to being in conformance with one oh, MRSA. Oh, skipped over that. <laughs> Draft motion ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council in conformance with one MRSA, subsection 4056 C and F. Just F. I'm sorry, just F. Enter, hereby enters into executive session four, section F, which I just read. Thank you. Sorry. Do we have a second for that? Thank you, Sarah. Discussion? No? All in favor? Any opposed? We are adjourned to executive session, and then we will return to our regular meeting for our adjournment. But the TV is over. TV is over. Thank you. <laughs>